happens? Zero on Chalet. You look a little bit further back in the Elite Community Series. They won over a team called Primitive 7 4 on Chalet. They won uh, in the uh, back at the end of last year over Champion, a well established team, 7 4 on Chalet. And you look even further back, you know, earlier, Blazing Star 7 0 on Chalet. This is a map that Daystar have always loved. And on the flip side of that, Diewolves lost this very recently in the Elite Community Series to a team called Devil Package that don't even play in the Asia League. So, really, you could not ask for a better opportunity for Daystar to kick off with a win in their debut. Right, so here we go. Ban phase is rolling by us as uh, we talk about the stakes for this match. And I think, yeah, it's, it's been pretty interesting so far. monzi has been taken out. It seems to be a staple pick so far of the region, at least off the back of that last matchup between uh, Jolita and Fury. It, it felt like it was being picked essentially every second round, Div. I don't know about you, but yeah, certainly taking away Monty does take away a bit of a front line, I think, for Diewolves very much starting on the attack. I wouldn't say that on the attack on Chalet there is a bit of like a, a necessary evil on your lineup. I feel like there are a multitude of things that you can make work, especially in the current meta. But I think that Monty in this particular region is a pretty fair band to go with. Yep, I'm a big fan of it. I think it's a smart ban, especially when you're going up against a team that... I mean, I know a a APR, they used to be called yeah, Daystar. Like They're smile. not an unknown quantity, but uh, was, it a, was it deliberately a smile? It, it, it looks just... like a little smile. Oh, that was so cute. Anyway. <laughs> that is really not. If intentional, I respect. Uh, but I have no doubt that this Monty ban is intentionally going to uh, prevent Daystar from having uh, free map control, you know, that kind of brute force ability that Monty brings to the table. Uh, for the astute of you who've been keeping on the patch notes, there was recently a patch note that came out about shields. That uh, obviously we've had a shield rework recently, but the shields now, um, in the new patch, no longer are your feet exposed while you're just crouching with your shield. It used to be a little bit more exposed. Um, so shields, right after this shield buff, have just been buffed again. <laughs> so, oh, uh, yeah, see. definitely want to get rid of those. Interesting. Very interesting. So, uh, was that? intentional from the beginning it makes me wonder anyway don't worry we'll have this discussion later speaking of shields we've got Osa being picked up in the absence of the monty we still have at least some of the shield control some of that zoning control that uh, we wanted in the first place and that's on on felarx on direwolves momarin on the other side for daystar is gonna look for a roam over in the top floor and not to be met by anyone as direwolves looking to sweep across the map from inside of library Does seem to be KZB the first point of contact. As you said, Momo's up here as well. Vert potential. Can actually work both ways pretty well. Nika on repel now. So he's going down to outside West Main. So Dawes are looking to, to pressure this. Obviously, it's a big roam from the basement, but they're not over committing as of yet. They're not just sending bodies in. They're playing it nice and slow. I think it's the right play. Uh, you've got some really strong operators here uh, on the cards for the defense on this top floor. So you want to be careful at KZB. Don't go running straight into a Solus, for example. Interesting defense as well here from Daystar. They've actually elected to reinforce off the master walls and then leave the office walls soft. Fairly unusual well, for this uh, defense of the bomb site go over and signing. Now, what that does mean is that they have given up control of office entirely to the attack. That's why this Ram Gadget can go in and play the vertical. That will vet, then vacate dining. But it means that it's made it much harder for them to actually then get control of the full top the floor, getting control all the way inside of uh, Master, for example, and translating that to Trophy is much harder with the setup they've gone for. Oh, Pico almost lining up too, going into Kitchen there, but not quite able to land the shots. And with a couple, uh, just a, under a minute left to go for Dire Wolves, they need to figure out what they want to do next. KZB walking into the line of sight uh, of Pico as he looks through the vertical, but Neon's able to trade that one back. I was going to say, finally a pick here for Pika, but might be enough even though the trade came back again because Diwolves have a solid breach and they have the Osa, as you mentioned earlier. Felarx here has found a nice long angle pick onto Hijack and he's going to bring out the second shield. And Nade comes out. Lovely to see Osa with Nades in the new Year 9 patch and he's going to move on up. Souffle coming to support. He's a massive player, but a great C4. But the flank comes through. Neon does recompose. After his C4, he finds a kill to back it up with the SMG. 
Joe goes in, but Momo puts Seal in the ground. It's a 1v1. Shotgun v shotgun. <gasps> and Momo gets it. Not every day you see the double ITA sidearm shotgun go head to head. But there you have it. Frost winning it with the Halo skin, no less. Well, that was a close round between these two. Very entertaining. Uh, as it came in through the execute, Pika managed to find the two picks to kick things off from his window and uh, eventually uh, Philarx making those Osa shields work very well to his name. Able to claim two very long line of sight kills. And I think ultimately for Daystar, even though they lacked a little bit of that discipline from the early to mid round, somehow they got scrappy enough in those fights to claw the picks back in the late rounds. And my god, what a 1v1 it was to close it out. Yeah, I was, my brain was just trying to keep up with it. As soon as I yeah. saw the double IDA shotguns against each other in close range, I was like, mate, you could not ask for like a worse gun to be trying to take that fight with, and yet both of them have it. That's funny. <laughs> Honestly, I feel like that one could have gone either way. It just, it just felt like such a scrappy round from the beginning to the end. And to be honest, I feel like that is what we're going to see from these two teams throughout the entire time. Lack of discipline, but it makes for some fun gameplay. It really does. I was, I mean, obviously, uh, very solid foundation back in the day. Pika and Souffle are the real OGs. They've always been star players for this roster, and now they are the veterans. Uh, Pelox has been around for a hot minute as well. Seal, we could say. Joe's really the, the main new one here for Die Wolves. Uh, whereas on the other side, they start a lot of new players to this level. Of All right, here we go. Pika, the man of the hour. And you look back statistically in 2023 was very much the highest rated player for Dire Wolves uh, for the year. Top rated in the league for the last chance qualifier in stage two as well. And uh, very much nowhere near the rest of his teammates. We're looking towards him to see what damage he can do now. Just postured outside a library. Seal as well is going to try and capitalize on some of the info going out into office as well. There is Momo Rin on the other side. Joe is going to take an engagement onto a player inside a solar, but Seal here is the one that we're really on board with who's being really cautious. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's a nice way to kick it off. I love the Keratos. Add a little bit of style and flavor to it as well. I don't know what you're going to do here, Dials. You better have something cooking because 3v5... No refrags so far. And at the moment, they're seemingly just baiting for picks. Joe's low HP. Yeah. This is not a great start to a round, i got to say. Oh, and what? there you go. It goes from bad to worse. Momo's doing more. Momo's actually got the Keratos out as his primary. Joe almost finds a freebie, but I think he's just fluffed his chance to do so. Melox is jumping into the action now. Kotli is looking for something to hold down this fought on the side the rest of his team nearby but it's pretty basic it's pretty easy one kill oh this is the chance on the second but it doesn't matter because his teammate comes in to support and that is an even more convincing round to get off at daystar yeah i mean yeah daystar are just looking to hold their ground in the individual points of the map really momo even though there was info on him he was able to find three from the same half wall or two or three from the same spot in half wall not only that but Kotli as well holding on to the bottom side right at the end there and preventing anyone from getting in it just felt like yeah the engagements looking pretty disconnected i would say on the perspective of die wolves it felt you know, like a more one-to-one -one engagement than looking for refrags, looking to play off the back of Intel, and uh, it just felt like that's where Daystar thrive. They won all their engagements, and that was close of the round. It's me. Hi, Mandy. It's a Mandy. What, what's going on? <laughs> Why am oh, I go. in a box? <laughs> that was so scary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm lucky there. <laughs> Now the real focus we want is to put on Diwolves and Daystar. I want to say mainly Daystar. I know Chalet is a pretty attack side of map. We're already seeing Daystar with two rounds in a row on their defense. So good start for them as the underdogs. And uh, starting on the unfavored side. They're looking very organized. They've got to give them credit. Like, we already rattled off the stats. Chalet is a great map for them back when they were APR. Not necessarily so for Tywalls, but we're really seeing that in the deck of strategies. You know, when you're bringing out Castle and Mirror, you've spent a lot of time dry running something. 
Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking forward to what this will come up with. Not only is there the mirror dev, but there's also the castle and the Izami to try and protect the setup going on as well. So it makes me think that Daystar have got a lot of layers to this onion. Here goes uh -huh. Souffle. <laughs> I know, we've been talking about the, the onion, onion theory. Again. <laughs> yeah, back around the onion meta. Uh, good first pick, though, on the side of Dire Wolves and probably what they need going into potentially uh, their third attack rounds here of losing out to Daystar, who have looked pretty sharp so far in the series. Getting at the first pick will be a little bit of a spike of confidence there. Yeah, KZB is low as well, so it could be a nice way to get it back. And there you go, KZB finished off, but goes traded. Still, that's a win for Dire Wolves here, numbers advantage, and yeah, it's just gonna compound. Hijack is able to find his kill. This back into the realm of possibility. Neon is a great weapon to deal with these long range engagements as well. You want to be a bit of a headshot machine. And you know, for Dire Wolves, just gotta be really careful here, because it could so easily become just a couple of 1v1 fights, and they lose this advantage. You know what? You never know. I agree with you. You've got to hold your tongue between these two teams. You never know what might come out of the hat. A seal looking to repel up, but decides to take the ladder instead. I mean, fair enough. You're a bit further away from your opponents. The bees locking out a jump out as Neon goes for the swing out onto the balcony onto Souffle and takes his head clean off. You said it, but the UMP does pack a punch and is a bit of a headshot machine. And here goes Felarx onto locking in onto the player inside a closet. It's hijack. It's all on his own in a 1v2. Come on, I will 2v1. Yeah, there we go. Just lock it in. Hijack goes down. And a solid conversion of the early man advantage. Oh, you saw the nade sink on through. That's beautiful. You can't cook him anymore, but you can mm, still nice. use the flush positions. Very well played by Diwolves. They finally have their first round. But of course, they start now have kitchen dining back open again. And bar will be open this round as well. So we've seen good things from them. It's still mm -hmm. early days in the game. Yeah, absolutely. And not just that, but even though we are going back to the kitchen and dining bomb site, which yes, Daystar won, but it was like by the skin of their teeth, right? The ITA 1v1 right at the end there. It's going to be hard to replicate that same success, especially when you're relying on such a scrappy brand of gameplay that they've been bringing into this defense so far, right? I've been enjoying it. I think it's pretty fun to watch, but it does make me a little bit worried for them. And surely this is a chance for Direwolves to tidy things up a bit. Get a second crack at some of these bomb sites. Now you've seen the setup as well. They're a pretty solid setup as we've seen from A star. The Maestro as well, really good site information. This Rome game on the top floor was quite a challenge for Direwolves to clear. And uh, I've actually seen the Osa this time for Direwolves as well. I thought maybe we'd see a similar idea, but instead going for this Ram. So perhaps a very vertical center to take this time. I would have to agree with you on that as well. Last time around, they brought along the ram for a similar purpose, and it seems like Daystar have gone for a similar setup themselves as well, not electing to reinforce off the office walls, but instead take a step back and reinforce off the master walls instead. So once again, it does afford control to die wolves all the way up through office. It will allow them to play the vertical. It might not be necessary for them to take the entire top floor, but that's the risk that Daystar have gone with um, for this particular strategy. Really scared as well, just seeing how aggressive Momo is in this top four, peaking a little bit too much towards library. I think he's fallen back now on the souffle. Pretty uh, ambitious to try and have just a crack in the window, but he could catch someone off guard here from the big window. Our wolves are really are taking their time here, looking to clear. It's a, a nice setup for the base start, completely locking off office and focusing instead on bathroom and master as their primary points that they're trying to hold on to for as long as possible. It makes me wonder if I was really going to force this clear. It, it is intriguing, isn't it, right? Because in theory, for Die Wolves here, once they've got the office control, they don't necessarily need to push out further than that. From that point on, they could just hold on for the retake and then look to pressure the objective instead, which seems like what they're going to go for here. Felox is going to open up the wall. Kotli is a bit too late on that uh, K charge to go for the trick on it. And now it's just up to Direwolves to actually pressure out the site without losing their man count. 
Joe on the top as well with the ram charges is going to completely vacate the bomb site directly below them. That's a massive blind spot for the Ooh. defense. Oh, if they can land the attack following from that, Pika as well with the first pick of the round. That's really good flank watch as well. Um, Guy was put that pressure on by verting open the office floor, forcing Momo back. And there's Pika on the upside down repel waiting for the player hijack for a trade, but it's just not going to happen at this point. Pika's rotated his position over to the trophy window. And Felarx is trying to set up for a plant position. However, still Evil Eye not dealt with. Another player pushing in from West Main. In come the flashes. The Evil Eye still delivering the information. These flashes aren't landing. He needs to wait for Souffle. Joe finds his pick and Souffle's timing is off. He at least gets something to bring it back. And Hijack left all alone. Won't even find a second kill. Seal puts him in the dirt. Direwolves are firing up. It might have been a slow start, but this is much more the form we've been looking for. A yeah, very well read attack there for Direwolves, very much playing into the weaknesses of that defense, taking full office control, realizing that was the real estate that had been given to them free and fully capitalizing off it, completely vacating the bomb site down below inside of dining. I just allowed Phalox to send in those flashbangs, allow his team to make their move off the back of that, and then go and play the objective. But even that wasn't necessary because they were able to collapse in onto the claustrophobic bomb site that was left behind in the wake of that vertical play being played out earlier in the round. Round. And yeah, Die Wolves, I think, with a very calculated execute towards the end there. And it's forced Daystar to take their tactical now as well. I think this is probably a good time to take the tactical pause, right? You win your first two defenses, that's a bit of a. Uh, I don't know if upset's the right word, but you're going against the grain, right? You're starting strong on your defense, the unfavored side on Chile when you are the underdogs. Uh, and since losing two in a row afterwards, and particularly that last one was fairly dominant from Direwolves, uh, this is the time when you want to jump back into it. What is ED saying to the guys during this tactical timeout to bring it back together? Attackers need mm. to locate uh, that's a good question. I think, for me, the way that I'm looking at this team at the moment, and uh, with the lack of experience they've got in the Tier 1 scene, I think when you repeat a strategy like that, like you haven't flexed that much of the strap book, right? You've gone back to the same bomb site, you've played exactly the same setup, and within one round, Direwolves have gone and figured out a pretty clear adaptation. I think it's important then for a team at this level to not get locked in their way of thinking and think that just because the strap book is there that they have to go and stick to it. They have to do it Rio for Rio, word for word. I think, you know, ED in my in that instance is probably better off encouraging them to try new things, uh, you know, uh, keep an open mind in the server and be willing to go back to a different bomb site, try something different. And, you know, I think the longer that you can prolong that line of thinking, it's, it's probably better for a newer team. They started to keep trying new things. And moving over to Bar Games, which was a bomb site that they won quite convincingly. I think, really I think that really just mainly uh, was on the back of the was, I don't know, the guy roaming in the office for like three kills last time. Oh, and he's, he's already started with one. Yeah, he's doing it again, but he is traded. So uh, I think that's not too bad for Direwolves. Yeah, it's uh, losing a player, but you can't be too upset when you've taken down the top fragger from the enemy team uh, and the main Roma that stunted your push last time around. Direwolves once again looking to sweep the map. We've seen them do this essentially every attack around. It doesn't look like they're going to change their pace anytime soon. Aided by the bees, of course, Souffle is going to zone out the player inside of the display hallway and KZB can no longer sit on that shield without getting pinged out by the intel. And that will allow some of the attack plays to start to creep their way on through the building. Where the bees have actually a couple of bees have gone a little bit further down the hallway as well. The bees are flooding display, and Joe is able to push on the back of that. Get that kill. Great way to clear the position. Neon is able to find Pika though. And Hijack still got his position at the top of blue. Oh, this is great. Yeah, the dock. Perfect operator to be playing here in library. Able to contest so many different long angles. Direwolves need to figure out a way to deal with them. This is where I want to see Direwolves slow it down here and just be cautious going into the last few plays a day so you don't know what kind of tricks they're going to pull out of the hat. And at this point, if you're too overzealous in getting this control on the top floor, one of these guys is probably going to fall to Neon. That's where they need to be really careful. He's just sitting in an off angle inside of Library. I don't know if they know he's there just yet. It's funny because he is actually vulnerable to a really solid upside down repel on that window and he's almost never going to win that fight. You just need a crossfire here, Direwolves. 
But Neon is still not revealed. His drone was spotted out early. Oh, Neon does find one kill, but is traded on back again. Good refrag potential there from Diewalls, and they lock in. Hijack in a 1v1. Oh, but he loses it. Joe gets him on the angle. We get to see this shot as well. Quick adjust at the last moment. And a quick spray down to lock in Diewolves getting three rounds in a row. Yeah, really scrappy round between these two teams once again, but I think good composure there from Diewolves at the end to play the trade game. Uh, anticipate the re-aggression that came from Daystar. I feel like Daystar have been quite a forwards team in general, characteristically, um, throughout the entire series. And I think it was right there for Direwolves to make their move, but then expect the retake to come on through from Daystar. And uh, they ended up making the decision to double push back up the stairs, try and retake the top floor to aid their teammate, which I think ultimately was the more undisciplined decision to make, and Direwolves punished them for it. I think Diwolves have a pretty solid read on the aggro. Yeah. Rotations. So we've seen it two rounds in a row now. Diwolves, how many players are dying? Because Daystar are just trying to make some moves, make some rotations. And uh, yeah, the re-aggro, yeah, it makes sense, right? If you're a player down, you want to get back into the fight. You want to re-aggro, because if you don't, if you play patiently, then more often than not, you're going to lose because you're at a disadvantage. But it's just being read too well. Five seconds to go. So they start, take their tactical after losing two. They lose the following round as well. It's quite grim. Yeah, it is a little grim for them. I wouldn't say it's like by means and ends all over for them or anything like that. I think they'll still go into this next round feeling confident. I feel like that's been sort of their brand of gameplay so far. They've looked really, you know, they've done everything with conviction. And I think that's, that's quite positive for the team at the moment. It, it's just that not everything feels as calculated as what direwolves are doing. I think that in terms of the way that direwolves are interpreting the game and the motions of it from a macro level, they look a little better at the moment. The last three rounds, that's for sure. They haven't been... I guess the last round did end up as a 1v1, but these rounds don't feel close. I yeah. feeling... All right, so here goes Joe from down below. They have got some info onto the player on the ground floor. That's the, the vigil of KZB. Bit wary of some of the vertical from inside a bathroom, but um, there's no one there to meet him on the other side. There is still that player now being red pinged out as well. So vigil will know that he has been spotted out and he's going to make that rotation out inside of jungle. Seal is using the opportunity to get aggressive. KZB tries to fool the drone. Souffle has gone in for a backstab, but he is taken down. Trades back and forth again. Diwolves come out in the advantage. As I say Ooh. that, Neon comes up to steal it back. Momo jumps into the fray as well. Seal left a little bit separated from the ability to refrag those players. And now a number down. Diwolves have just two players up to try and force themselves in. Now they're very close to this bomb site. Oh, well, cheeky angle. Yeah, nice angle from Momo there. Off angle right in the middle of the office wall. Not one that someone would expect, and Seal with the 1x isn't going to take that engagement to his favor. Going to try and put an ash charge in the wall, at least make a run in hole to make uh, this entry work. Three headshots. Half oh, Time to ash it up. Yeah, I was just thinking that. Could he maybe plant here? Ooh. Almost baited out. Momo's going around the corner. He knows about this aggro. Oh, uh. two players at once and can't adjust the target in time. So a good, solid and patient retake there from Daystar. 3v1, but they don't over-aggress. And they do finally break the spell that Diewolves had placed on them. Three rounds in a row, and finally one back to even the half. It really feels like every single round that we've watched is somehow in like within 30 seconds of the round, it's 3v2 or 2v3, depending on, I don't know, whose side you're on, right? It just feels like that early game pressure that's coming on from both of these sides is so scrappy um, both ways, and they're really keeping the pace with each other so well. But then it, by the time that we hit that late rounds, it ends up being so situational, and, and it feels like whoever is able to dial it back a little bit, like take a step back, just a small one, and then actually think about their situation that they were in for a little bit, they end up coming out on top there, right? I felt like Daystar 
in that final defense, yes, they realized that they had the numbers advantage, but they didn't make the decision to go and re-aggro and to put themselves forward, right? They realized that their teammates had done enough work. Whereas I think for Direwolf's got a bit overzealous there in that two on three or three on three, trying to go for extra picks, right? So I think, yeah, in the end there, it's, it's more about discipline, I think, once it hits the late round between these two teams. And I think whoever makes that decision first seems to come out on top. No, I feel you on that. Both these teams seem to be looking when they're a man down to be aggro and locate a bomb and That's what they started doing when they lost that room. And you've got to be really careful when you have that number of like You saw Daystar in that 3v1. The Irwells failed to do so. They got punished. Now they have failed to win their attack off. Back it up on defense. And hopefully Daystar have cleansed themselves of the shakes that they had at the second half of the, well, the first half, they lost the throw. Could be optimistic for them now. Moving on to yeah, attack on Chile can always be a bit of fun, as long as you've got the right mix of patience and aggression. Just a little prick. Bit of info onto the lesion here on the ground floor of Felox, as Momo Rin's actually made his way all the way down into the basement. Felox could be in a bit of a pinch at this stage if the West Main push does come up from Momo Rin, although he's pretty wary of the flanks come up from behind him. It's a little unclear to me exactly where the pushes from base are. They, they keep repositioning. Yeah, they have lurkers kind of sneaking their way into position, but also players outside the building readjusting. That's not all the way through stairs, but... AZB is... Garage. This is... Is he going to go and try and clear Felox from below with the... Be the play. Here comes some util. Bees go out and Felux is indeed pinched out. Great usage. A player on the trophy window feels the killing blow. Good start here for Daystar on the attack. You called it perfectly. The util sync was what they need to land that attack and start off certainly very well for them. Another Firebolt to go in might enable this Repel in for Daystar and they can claim a little bit more control of the map. Keeping in mind the bomb site is in fact this top floor, so as they make their way in, they can very much posture for an execute from that position. I think the Neon here, he's actually gone and repositioned to the double window now, so Souffle would have a flank, especially if Peek is doing a solid job of distracting. Joe has a great position. Oh, Souffle is going for it! No! You're a soulless, you should never be dying to a Claymore. Now Joe has to do it all himself. 1v2. He hears that plant going down. Probably to force it. Impact goes out. Bit of a pre-fire. Oh, he spots the first and oh. the double. Massive clutch. Daystar kicking themselves because Diwals have just stolen the round. Oh man, Seal is happy about that one, mate. He's just absolutely stolen a round away with his teammate from uh, with his teammate Joe from Daystar. Great attack from them. Very calculated uh, going in towards the bomb site. They took their time. They even had pinches and flanks going on at the same time. Souffle didn't spot up the claymore, and it all looked like it was going so well for Daystar until Joe was just able to clean up that 2k right at the end of the retake as the plant was going down. Scrappy round once again, but Diwolves come out on top. Defenders, protect your bombs from being defused by attackers. Yeah. Wow. No day start. That was so close to being perfect. Like, they really brought it back. Well, I thought it was a very solid uh, attack. They were patient. They repositioned. They found a hell of a lot of picks. I believe it was Neon found most of them. Get a replay of that clutch. So the impact, it didn't achieve maybe as much as intended, but it really it was just hijacked. Overpeaking there. Getting a bit overzealous. Allowing that 1v1. Come through. Well, Joe Gore is having a phenomenal debut. I tell you what, Maddie, 10 kills in seven rounds. Neon as well on the other side, 12 and 5. We've got some big hitters on these teams. You take those guys out. Know, it feels like the round is done at that point. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, these guys have just been fragging out against each other, but I think you said it right. These two players have very much been the stars of the server for their respective teams. Uh, someone else I want to point out as well is like surely I know we keep seeing Momo in these like really aggressive positions and it feels like when he's there in the early game <laughs> it matters you know it matters and Souffle has gone and taken him out 
Last time, I think we saw him going for that roam, uh, sorry, that lurk game on the Ash across the other side of the map. Souffle's gone and read into that, and he's taken him out early. Yeah, big early pick, but another one goes through. So good C4 from Joe, who's now found his 11th kill. Yeah, this is pretty awkward now for Daystar. How you come back on the late 3v5. It doesn't happen without you getting a couple of freebies. And so that's what they will start to look for. But it's not going to be found. Knee on the top fragger in the server has been served. 2v5 now. AZB is just waiting for something. I don't think he's going to get I don't think he's going to get anything either. Direwolves look pretty patient in their positions there. There's a player behind the cabinet to his left. That could spell oh, no. disaster for him. That's Felox. He's going to round the corner with the Vector in hand. Uh, oh, no, he hasn't gone through that, Rosie. Oh, no, it's ringing oh, around the Rosie. Oh, Rosie. KZB. <laughs> he's just gone and backstabbed him, but it doesn't matter anyway. Peek is able to claim up the last one, and Direwolves get around. That was well-deservedly theirs. Yeah, it was until a brief moment of a day star showing up. But oh yeah, God. all right. I was a found the runner with that, Mandy. They're actually starting to run away with this game. Uh, it feels a little bit slow and steady that it, it's come to this point. And you said it well. All of these rounds are really scrappy. Like, so hard for these teams to, to maintain a numbers advantage. And an early pick here or there because oh of my the God. Advice <laughs> swing. <laughs> <laughs> it was so big. I was like, cat and mouse, but you've just watched the mouse go through the wrong hole. <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> not good. Oh, oh God. Star, man. Yeah. Like, oh, well, they got to do something at this point. They're going to see the first snowmobile wine attack. Maybe that'll merit something for them. They themselves didn't collect to defend it at all on their half. I don't know if that's because they... And no good at the site, and perhaps it reflects poorly on their chances of winning here, or maybe they think that it's a bad site and they have some amazing attacks for it. I'm gonna be optimistic for their sake and say it's the second. I kind of want to believe in that too. Um, I like the lineup that they're going for. This is quite exciting. They've got Nook. I like this. Nook has gone out of fashion a little bit these days, but when it does come into play, it's exciting because it's, it's new and stuff. Also, Hot and Cold's really good at it when he does Hot on SSG. So I'm hoping for KZB's sake that when he goes into his attack, he can do his best Hot and Cold impression and try and inject himself into the map and find some good kills. A while since we've seen a lot of good around. It's the Silent Step removal and the nade nerf. And the She's a bit squeaky nerf. now. She's had a lot of nerfs. Kind of mm. unfortunate. Uh, it is actually being changing right now. I think that, yeah, it's to clear util on the wall. Let's see if it works. No, it didn't seem okay. All it seemed to do was clear a Vulcan canister, but still the wall is electrified. I'm not sure where the electric wall is. Oh, maybe the Vulcan canister was like on the floor, like blocking the nade trajectory. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. body blocking it, Goyo thingy blocking it, canister blocking it. Oh, there is a player on that window and they know. Freebie. Kill him! Oh no! Get him, bro! Get him! He's right there! <laughs> no way Souffle gets away with his life there! Oh dear. He really oh should my. have been punished. That should have been a free kill for Daystar. And that will go begging. They're lacking a lot of confidence on their attack. We've seen it now for the third round in a row. It's a little bit of shakes. That drone came out, clearly pinged it, and yet not the commitment to land the shot, not the commitment to swing on the back of it. And now just so much time being wasted. Pika does mask the sound of his drop, but Kotli immediately Ooh. goes in and finally gets the opening kill for Daystar. That was a bit brave there for Pika to then go in for that rotation and Kotli finding some good timing on that as well. Here goes Hijack down the lobby stairs to try and find the remaining plays in the ground floor, but it seems like most of them have fallen off. I think there's only one left somewhere on the ground floor. Nope, all four of them now back in towards the bomb site, feeling like they've got enough value out the room. But here's where the ram is going to start to come into play for Momo Rin. Uh, putting the Mars Rover down on the floor is going to force some of those defenders to at least vacate half of the bomb site going into Wine Cellar. Yeah, the thing is, there's still so many good power positions for Die Wolves to play, and that's exactly where they are. In a blue behind the shelf in Snowmobile and uh, in Connector, even in the safe spots in Wine. And so we need to see Daystar pinch out these positions. This Connector hat being open would actually assist with that. The gas is going to lock out Con. There's no solid breach on the snowmobile wall. Hijack has oh to no. rotate. 
no way of clearing the electric floor. What are Daystar going to do? Because they've lost their backstab as well. It's looking very rough for the newest team to the league, but they finally found another pick and oh, another one wolves. at that. Seal steps up and holds the fort down on site, but it does leave it all up to Felox. Kotli's gone down. The fuse are being planted. No gas to speak of. Zero on the clock. Hijack forcing down the plant. Momo looking to cover. The plant has been confirmed. And Felox, he finds his first. The second now goes begging as Momo's gone upstairs. And it's biding his time. It's baiting it out. And there's the R4C to deliver the killing blow. There is no world where Daystar should have survived that round. And yet they did. I cannot believe that Direwolves have just given them that one. What on earth was that round there? Daystar, by all means, did not have any win conditions going into that round, right? I mean, maybe they went for the one plant spot that they actually could have made that work with the connector drop. But in towards the end there, Direwolves just going in relentlessly for those last ditch engagements. That was really scary from Direwolves and Daystar somehow able to collect that one off the back of what was a pretty monumental uh, yeah, rush into the bomb site in the last couple of seconds in the round. They absolutely went deep for it because they knew that was their final win condition to possibly get that done. This blue push in particular uh, onto the one player that maybe could have prevented this push coming down from the main stairs, not just that, but in tandem as well with the connected player going down was what they needed to secure that plant spot behind the shelves. I oh, know, Mandy. Direwolves are not You'll looking know. in great form at the moment. It's oh, it's just it's so hard to watch a round like that, where they really should have had everything in their favour, where it looked like Daystar were just going to fall to pieces, and then, yeah, that happened. Uh, even yeah, Felox I mean, had a decent chance at the end there, but oh, it's it's moments like that that make it really hard to believe in Direwolves at converting these advantages. We had a slew of really solid rounds from them in a row, and then something like that happened. I mean, I'm, I'm going to sound like a bit of a broken record, I think, talking about this, Jeff. But, like, I, again, I just think it's discipline, really, between these two teams, honestly. I think there have been some rounds that I feel have gone the way of one team over the other because someone has chosen to be a bit more a bit more patient for, like, one or two more seconds or actually gone and taken a step back and thought of the situation in a situational way and then gone and problem-solved or something like that, right? Whereas I feel like, you know, in that last round there, for example, Tywolves lacking a bit of discipline, getting a bit overzealous with gunfights, being relentless, it's not always the solution. I'd put your finger on a solution when you're in the middle of a game as well. I was having it make it tactical. So it is on the cards for them, still available. Daystar, on the other hand, wasted theirs. I did say wasted, they immediately lost the following round. Daystar are going to have to keep pushing from here. Three more rounds in a row to guarantee the full points in this matchup. I was just need one more round to secure their first point of the season. Here comes a run out from Souffle, but it's been red like a book. Great start for Neon. Direwolves already fighting from the back seat. Good first pick, but can they convert it from here on the attack? It does look like a solar centric one for Daystar as they shape up to repel their way on in. KCB down below has an inkling that Felux here is actually going to look for the hatch drop as the way out. Could be potentially a great read here. Damage ringing out for Hijack as well. The LMG ringing true onto Joe as he's taken down very low. And there goes Momo though on the other side to claim the second one for Daystar. It's certainly looking like a solid attack round from here on out, but you never know in these rounds. True, Joe is still alive and he's been one of the most dangerous players. He finds his 13th. Oh dear. He's been downed immediately after. How have Daystar just sat on windows and repels and found four kills? I would love to know. Dials again struggling. Attackers with their discipline, their is Felox going to be able to get this revive off? Seems to be some information ringing out on the site. He is going to pick up Joe here. So one teammate back on his side. A full rotate out of go? Daystar. The, yeah, they've gone actually to completely change the side of the map they're going to push from. And he's jumping on his cameras. I don't know what's going mm. on. Joe's found Momo. This is very scary. Especially mm. when Kotley gives up a pick like that. How is this happening again for Daystar? 1v1, Neon versus Joe, the top frag is in the game, 
Go head to head. Neon round in the corner, but he doesn't know where Joe is. Keratos oh, no. to win it. Die Wolves, once again, a match point, but stolen away. Oh no, I cannot believe that's just happened twice in a row now. But on the flip side, instead, Dev, Daystar, they had that round two right. Solar attack, first, second pick, even third pick coming in. And then somehow, maybe the overthinky. <laughs> overthinking Let's disease. fully rotate. It's a 3v1. Let's fully rotate to the side that's of the map that we haven't pushed yet. That's that's what I'm thinking as well, right? We're, we're on site. We're on site with Felox on board with him. His teammate is down. He's being super cautious because he thinks that all of us swarm in on the site. They're the one person on the bomb site. And then they're on the other side of the map. It's it's strange, I think, to put it in any way, Dev. It feels a little bit overthought there from Daystar. And it cost them, unfortunately. Felox was able to get the pick up onto Joe, who put a pretty great effort in to win them out the round there. I mean, it's 16 and 6 at the moment. Plus 10 for his KD. To be fair, on the other side, like Neon's having a great one as well. I believe it was 16 and 8. That's still a 2.0 KD. Ah. Uh. It's just, it's so painful to, to get that hope for Daystar when they seemingly have a really strong round with all those early picks. And it falls apart. Diwell's credit to him, like they've got some good pickups. I've been really impressed by Joe. We've said his name a lot, but you know, he's the newest one on this roster. And uh, I think that he's uh, clearly a very fiery player. Absolutely. But it's just, it's so challenging to know what to say about these teams when it is a lack of discipline sometimes that lets these rounds slip away. I mean, I think, yeah, Joe's just been, like, excellent. It feels like all the positions that he's been thrown into has made an impact, like, quite a heavy one. 16 and 6 is no small scoreline, especially in a matchup where it feels like there's gunfights left, right, and center. Uh, it's certainly an advantage here to be winning those ones out. And I think, ultimately, yeah, for Daystar, that last round was probably the most curious of the lot to me, that it felt like that was the most convincing entry into the attack that they'd gotten, and then not able to convert it after that is cer certainly something that I would go back to the drawing board and, and have a look back at that one again. Well, into the final round of the game here, Mandy. We're going to kitchen dining. This was the second round of defense we saw out of Direwolves, and it was a pretty convincing one. They start after fumbling that massive opportunity have a, an even bigger task ahead, and that is tracking into this bomb site, which seemed to be untouchable from Direwolves. And I don't think they're going to be able to achieve that by sitting on windows and repels like they did last round. I'd have to agree with that as well. I think they've got to get their hands dirty in the building, and that's exactly what Neon has decided to do. You pointed out pretty well the other top fragger of this server so far, 16 and 8 as well, matching so far uh, his counterpart and Joe on the other side is going to be the entry for the team, followed up by KZB. Sweep across the map so far, so good, although the next challenge that they have to face is getting open some walls. And well, even though Thatcher's up, they haven't brought it along with them. Guess who they've killed? The man of the hour. The man of the hour, the man himself. Yeah, if there's anyone you want to take out as an opening pick, it's definitely Joe when he can clutch up like we saw last round. Like you said, Util's also part of the game, and we've got a shield cleared. Nice job. Piano, Neon. He's been the playmaker for Daystar. Top fragger. Still a, a little bit of progress made here on the ground floor and on the top floor as well, but Soufle is still contesting. Hijack is going to... Oh, I was going to say open up, but no, the Tuberau is there to delay this... For as long as possible, oh. Neon's good for another one. Maybe he's going to pop 20 kills in this game if he keeps it up. Out go the concussions and threatening a push into sight now. Did Daystar commit early? What on earth? The double claimer on the door as well. Neon is cooking something up. He only needs two more for the 20 bomb. There is a player in his sights. Can he take him down? That's Felox on the other side. No, he can't. Pika is going to take him down from elsewhere, and that's the 20 bomb dream god now for Daystar. With 45 seconds left to go, it is back to a three on three once again. And Daystar have pretty much rotated as well. We've got a player outside of West Main, a player outside of Trophy. Hijacks also here on West Main, so all of that control established on the lobby side, on the top floor, completely gone. In goes Hijack, somehow manages to jump in without dying. But Daystar are now in a rock and a hard place with Souffle up oh, above, Soufflé. trying desperately to land some shots. His position revealed, 
But he gets spotted by a player walking straight up the stairs. Hijack steals that. And now Felax, he finds his first. Almost a second, but not found. Pika now coming in for the flank. Has to 1v2 for the game. A C4 to go out. It could make a nuclear impact. A 1v1 now. Momo against Pika. Does he have the info? Does he know? He's got an inkling. Momo can't wait forever. The DMR packs a serious punch. And as he rounds the corner, it's only going to take two bullets to win the game for Direwolves. Oh, clutch after clutch. Scrap by scrap. Piece by piece. They steal the game away from a valiant effort of Daystar. But Direwolves, they're the top dogs today. Yeah, they certainly are, Die Wolves. What a way to end out the game. Like you pointed out, it felt like it was clutch after clutch, crazy round after crazy round, win conditions out the window. It was all in the gunfights at the end there. Pika landing some very critical shots in tandem with his teammates to close it out. I'm just looking back at my notes. I'm like, clutch, uh, clutch, 1v1, clutch, retake. That was a crazy game. Yeah, Both of these teams game. know how to make plays. They trust their instincts. When you got one guy going 18 kills, another guy going 16 kills, you know uh, you're in for a treat, especially when they're on different teams. Uh, I will credit Daystar though. Four rounds, four good rounds. Uh, that's credit to him. And you know, three, four of those 1v1s went the other direction. We'd be talking about a completely different result. Yeah, absolutely. I think between these two teams, it was just, it felt like any round could turn on a dime, the way that these 1v1s were going. And I think 7-4 scoreline probably doesn't do justice just how close some of those rounds were. Yeah, very much so. We'll break this all down after the break.